Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar presentation, a conversation with the commissioner, a look inside patent processes at the USPTO. I'm Allie Morton, Product Marketing Manager at LexisNexis IP. And we have a really exciting and informative webinar planned for you all today. First, I just need to cover a few housekeeping things though. During today's CLE, we will provide two participant verification codes. These codes will be provided verbally and visually at random times. Please ensure that you write these codes down as they will only be provided one time and cannot be repeated. You will need to use these codes to validate your attendance and receive your CLE certificate. Within 72 hours of today's event, all attendees will receive email notifications from LexisNexis University regarding this event. Attendees will receive an email alerting them to log into their LexisNexis University CLE accounts and validate their attendance using the two participant codes I mentioned earlier. Once the codes are entered and your participation is validated, you will receive your certificate of attendance via email. If your state is pending approval for this event, you will receive a notice regarding that status. Once approved, the certificate will be emailed. If you request credit in a state we do not currently have accreditation for or it is still pending, our CLE team will be notified that is needed and seek accreditation. Once approved, you will receive your certificate via email as well. Also during the webinar, please feel free to submit questions using the question feature in the control panel. Also in the question panel, you will see the handout section. This is where you can access the webinar slides from today's presentation. A follow-up email of the recording will be sent out to you later today or at the latest tomorrow morning. Now I would like to introduce our presenters. With us today, we have a stellar panel of speakers from the USPTO, including Drew Hirschfeld, the Commissioner for Patents. Drew manages and leads the patent organization as its Chief Operating Officer. He is responsible for managing and directing all aspects of the organization which affect administration of patent operations, examination policy, patent quality management, international patent cooperation, resources and planning, and budget administration. Drew received a Bachelor of Science from the University of Vermont and a JD from Western New England College School of Law. Along with Drew, we also have two other panelists joining us from the USPTO, Jay Kramer and Matthew Such. Jay Kramer is a group director in patent operations who is currently leading an agency effort to modernize how applications are routed to examiners. He has previously served in a variety of management roles at the agency supporting international programs, data analytics, and examination. Jay holds degrees from University of Notre Dame and Carnegie Mellon University. Matthew Such is also a group director in patent operations and is currently leading agency efforts to implement artificial intelligence for patent specific use cases. He has previously served in a variety of management roles at the agency supporting international programs, patent classification and examination. Matthew holds degrees in engineering from Purdue University and Northwestern University. Also joining us today, we have Megan McLaughlin, the product director for LexisNexis Patent Advisor. After graduating from Harvard Law, she worked as a patent attorney at the law firm of Nutter, McLennan and Fish. Her technical focus reached into a variety of industries, including medical devices, food industry, software, printers, and biotech. And last, but certainly not least, we have Jean Quinn. Jean is the founder of IP Watchdog, a patent attorney, law professor, and leading commentator on patent law and innovation policy. Jean has been named one of the world's leading IP strategists by IAM Magazine. Thank you all again so much for attending today's presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Gene. My microphone is muted. <laughs> uh, thank you, Allie, and thank you all for joining us here today for this webinar. We're really excited to have the commissioner and his uh, staff, Matt and uh, James with us here today. Again, uh, we did a webinar like this last year and it was a uh, a uh, great success. So I uh, reached out to Drew to see if he'd be willing to do it again. And he's always willing to try and talk to patent attorneys. And I've known Drew for a long time. And uh, I, I think we're friends, Drew, right? And um, we have uh, gotten to know each other. And the one thing I know about the commissioner is, is that he really does like to talk to patent attorneys. He is really one of us uh, on the 10th floor. He really cares about the patent system. And I think that that always comes through in his presentations. 
and considerations of the issues. So it's always a pleasure to have him and his team here with us to talk about these issues. We have a, a lot in store for today. And um, what I'd like to do before we go through and start the, the substantive presentation of the slides is to um, one, thank LexisNexis for sponsoring this webinar and sponsoring so many of our webinar series, because without sponsors, this is just not possible to do. We spent an awful lot of time putting this together. So thank you, LexisNexis. And then two, I want to bring the panel in and get everybody involved uh, right away. Um, each person's going to have a portion that they're going to talk about specifically today, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, but let's start with you, Drew, if we can. Um, we're going to cover a lot of ground today. Um, the, the big issue is how do applications get routed to uh, patent examiners and how do uh, applications get handled by the the office, uh, which which calls in so much of office process and procedure. But before we tackle that issue substantively, I always like to ask folks what it is that they would like the audience to have at the front of their mind, so kind of you know wet their whistle or prime the well, if you will. So in you know maybe one to two minutes. What do you think you'd like the audience to be thinking about before we begin the substantive part of the conversation? Thanks, Gene. Well, I'm happy to, to jump in with that. Let me just uh, start off by uh, thanking you for the, the introduction, the very kind words, and for having us here. Um, I'm going to talk, as, as you mentioned, that the primary goal for today is to talk about the routing of patent applications, and we've got a great new system uh, that we're implementing to, to address that. So I'm very excited to share that with all of you. I'm actually going to uh, talk a little wider about some other uh, ongoing uh, topics for PTO, uh, and then I'm going to talk about some changes that we have coming up October 1st, including the routing uh, in my portion. To get specifically to your question about what I would want people to walk away from, I think primarily it's that we at the USPTO are always looking at ourselves uh, to see how we can improve. And I think what you're going to see today are some changes that we're talking about that are to critically, uh, critically important uh, foundational and fundamental programs that we have at USPTO that we are making changes and improvements to. So uh, the one thing I would say is we are going to look at ourselves always uh, and continue to make changes and improvements, and you're going to hear about some of those today. Great. Th thanks a lot, Drew. Uh, James, let's let's go to you next, because I, I think in order you're going to be talking uh, after uh, Drew. Um, what, what is it that you would like uh, folks to be thinking about as we approach this, this big, broad topic today? Yeah, uh, thank you, Gene. Appreciate it. Um, so I'll, I'll be talking and, and sharing some background on, on the new routing system that we're going to put in place. And so from, from my perspective, you know, I'd like people to remember that, that yeah, we, we are, um, that we're about to engage in this updated methodology and this new approach to, to routing. That's, that's definitely coming here, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, the change, I think as you're hearing the slides, keep in mind that this change will allow us to, to finalize this transition we have away from the U.S. patent classification system into our new cooperative patent classification system, or CPC. But, but in, in as we make that shift, it was important for us to retain the expertise and institutional knowledge of our patent examiners who have been examining a certain technology and a certain, in, a, in a certain, under a certain routing system. We wanted to maintain that expertise to deliver those same high quality patents we've always been able to do. So, the, so as we compare those two systems, keep in mind that, that this is what we're striving for. Okay, great. Thanks, James. Uh, Matthew, um, I know you're gonna be talking about a little bit about what the future holds and where the PTO wants to be going moving forward, uh, which I think is uh, exciting uh, for what the future holds. What, what, what do you want people to be uh, thinking about today as we start the discussion? Sure, thank you, Gene. So I think we're all acutely aware that artificial intelligence has become this increasingly powerful tool that's been contributing to transformations ongoing in the economy right now. And the USPTO, we've recognized the potential value that AI can have on improving future agency operations and helping to strengthen the IP system. Um, we are looking at artificial intelligence for a number of different use cases, and today I'm gonna to be focusing on our efforts for developing and evaluating an artificial intelligence-based auto classification system. 
for patent documents that we seek to be able to utilize in the future. Um, I'll be highlighting some of the developmental efforts that are underway, uh, discussing some of the challenges uh, with uh, utilizing artificial intelligence technology and the approaches that we're taking here at the agency to overcome these challenges, as well as some of the potential benefits that we see on the horizon. Okay, great. Now, Megan, last but not least, I want to give you an opportunity. I, I know you, you and I, we're going to sort of tag team the, the, the Q&A of the, the panel here together. And you and I, we've been doing, um, I guess, you know, webinars on this topic. And I, I stutter there a little bit simply because it may be hard for some people to believe, but you and I actually talk about this issue a lot. And, you know, we geek out about yeah. this issue a lot to the point where, when we're on conference calls, other people want to hang up the phone and just let us talk. Um, what is it that you would like people to be thinking about as we approach this topic? Yeah, so it's funny that uh, this this topic has always been very important to me. Um, and, and Jean, we've said this before. I feel like classification is probably the most important strategic step in prosecution that most practitioners aren't thinking about. I think most of us just take it for granted that if you file a patent on some technology that it's going to go to the right examiner. Um, but it's actually really hard to do that. <laughs> it's, it's a really complex process. And, and the good news is um, that the USPTO has really been thinking about it. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's going to come through throughout this presentation. Yeah. And what, what I'll say is just my, my two cents before I turn it over to the commissioner here is, is during our pre-call, as we were, they were laying out the, and they mean uh, uh, Drew, James, and Matthew were laying out what it is they wanted to talk about. My eyes opened like saucers, and I thought to myself, "Oh my goodness, uh, this is going to be potentially one big and two very, very good." Uh, so I'm really excited. So let's just jump right into the substance. And uh, before I, I, I do that, one last housekeeping thing, just. For everybody who's here, now we have uh, well over 600 people with us live at the moment. Uh, if you want access to these slides, you can get them right now on the handout section on the GoToWebinar control panel if you are listening to this on online. Um, you can download them. Everybody will get access to the slides and to a recorded version of the webinar. And since uh, Ali said this at the beginning, we've had several hundred people join us, but we'll be giving codes out for CLE purposes throughout the webinar periodically that you'll need in order to claim CLE credit. So when the appropriate time comes and we're gonna release those codes, I'll have uh, Ali come back and join us and we'll go over that that again. Um, but uh, that's it. So Drew, where, where should I go here? I guess this slide is a good place to start. Yeah, that's great, Gene. Thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned in my Opening a couple minutes ago, I'm going to uh, talk about a variety of topics before we drill into the classification topic that, that mostly um, Jay will talk about and then the AI that Matt will talk about. Um, I wanted to give you all some background uh, and address some other changes as well. So I'm going to start uh, with the blue box that you all should be seeing on your screen. I wanted to give you some background about staffing and uh, as the USPTO as a whole, you know, we're, we're about 12,600 people. Uh, within the patents organization, we're at uh, about 10,000 people with uh, just about 8,100 examiners. So when you think about classification and the various applications that come in, um, we'll have 450,000 uh, approximately new applications filed in a given year. So getting those thousands, hundreds of thousands of applications to those thousands of examiners uh, in nine technology centers and over 600 art units is quite the challenge. Um, you heard Jay mention before about the, you know, making sure whatever we do uh, takes into account the examiner's experience. Uh, our average examiner has just about 12 years of service with the USPTO. And that is, is quite a fascinating number, especially when you look at how many we've hired in the last few years. So I think uh, with even notwithstanding a whole bunch of new examiners, uh, we have still 12 years of experience on the average examiner. And about 40% of those have uh, some sort of advanced degree, whether it's a law degree or a graduate degree. Um, so, so quite a, an educated staff as well. I'm gonna switch to the green now. And I, I, I included this slide because I wanted to give some background on our, our 
work at home programs, especially since we are virtually, you know, we're almost all at home right now. Um, as, as you're probably well aware, sometime in March, the, the PTO went to mandatory uh, work at home where everybody needed to be at home during this pandemic, uh, but for some, you know, critical employees whose work could only be done on the office, such as IT uh, systems, things like that. Uh, and now we're actually in a state where we're calling it maximum telework where we are encouraging uh, people to be at home. And honestly, uh, it's almost the same as the, the mandatory. We're letting people come in, but what we're seeing is we have about 100 employees uh, at any given time are in the office. And, and that's a minuscule number when you think about the, the numbers that we really have. So we are essentially um, working at home. Now before, the, the slide that's on the screen actually represents the telework before uh, the pandemic. So you can see that full-time teleworkers, uh, we had about 6,400 of them uh, out of the 10,000 or so employees within the patents organization. And going to the, it's like an orange uh, box, you, you can see that part-time teleworkers were about 2,400. So that's a, a, a huge, when you put those numbers together, uh, that's a large majority of our staff was telework ready in some form either to be able to work full-time or part-time, but they had the equipment, they had the ability. So when we switched over to mandatory telework due to the pandemic, we were in a good place to continue working um, and, to, and to continue to be uh, functional for all of you, right? For all of our users. Uh, we had just you know over a thousand people where we had to get equipment and teach them how to uh, work remotely. And I feel like we, we did that as seamlessly as can be. Uh, I'm really proud of my staff, honestly, of the way we transitioned uh, to this because there's a lot to work out uh, in situations like this. And I, I feel like we did this very well. And we've heard from our employees that they that they appreciate the way we've transitioned and got people equipment and information uh, about next steps. One of the re questions I get asked and one of the reasons why I wanted to show you these slides is I get asked about examiner productivity. Are examiners still working? Are they producing? Um, and I will start anecdotally and just tell you that I hear routinely that people are, are very thankful that examiners are still working. They're finding them available. They're able to have interviews. They're able to contact them. I hear that routinely in, in my interactions with people from the public. But we also, of course, do track our work product. And we're actually slightly trending at a, a higher productivity than what we expected for the year. And of course, what we expected did not include um, any, any changes for the pandemic. So when we looked at the year and planned, and we of course did not plan on, on a pandemic, um, we are actually trending slightly higher in the work, uh, amount of work, the work product that, that our examiners are producing. Now, I'll be the first to say that that's a very misleading statement that I said, not intentionally misleading, um, but what I'm getting at is, is while that is absolutely true, what I said, what's happening, like companies throughout you know, the world actually, is employees are not taking leave. They're not taking vacation time, you know, annual leave. So we do know that employees are building up um, large amounts of leave because they're not taking them. So part of the reason why we're able to, to produce uh, to the level we have been is because people are actually working more hours uh, than they would under normal situations. Uh, the reason why I said it's, it's misleading is because we are likely to have a latent impact here when, people, when the pandemic is in a place where people feel like they can take leave and take vacations, um, we're likely to see a drop off in productivity um, and that's something we're, we're well aware of. And, and again, I don't think this is unique to USPTO. I actually think this is, um, this is consistent with, with what everybody is seeing. And you know, people are not comfortable necessarily taking vacations, so they're staying here and they're working. Um, so that is why we are, are trending a little bit higher. So with that, uh, Gene, if, if I think you've got the, the slides. If you can go to slide four, please. There you go. Thank you. So I wanted to also address uh, our, our filings. Um, people are always asking about filings, especially now. Uh, so if we go to the blue box, what you can see on the screen is that for new cases, new filings, so serialized is the way we refer to new cases, basically, but, but our new case filing uh, through the end of June for the year is up compared to last year, about 1.4%. I often hear, you know, filings are tanking, filings are going down, um, and and 
it is at 1.4% uh, since the start of the year, um, which I think is a pretty healthy number. Now, uh, before March, we were actually trending at about a 4% increase as compared to last year. So there has been a decrease. So if we look at the numbers from March to the end of June, we are seeing a decrease compared to last year, and it's a decrease of about 2.5%. So there has been a decrease uh, related to new filings. Um, it hasn't impacted us from the year to date standpoint in the sense of actually being less than last year, um, but, but it is a, a decrease, uh, a little bit of a decrease in the time of the, the pandemic. We are actively uh, watching that, as you can imagine, um, you know, as obviously as a fee-funded agency, we, we need to make sure that we're we, we, we're able to sustain ourselves. And I think we're in a I think we're in a good place. Um, but we are actively watching this. I'll also point out that one of the um, areas that we're focused on, or issues that we're focused on, is that historically the patents uh, filings and revenues, and I'll address revenues in a second. But the, the patents filings and revenues have been um, lagging indicators of impacts to the economy. Uh, the trademark side of the house um, is a much uh, is a leading indicator. So when there's changes in the economy, they, they usually have immediate impacts. On the patent side, it is usually a delay. And I am hearing from from many people that they're concerned on the outside about their budgets um, and potential cutbacks to filings they can do. So we are actively watching that as well and being very cognizant that um, for the patent side, it, we could actually see larger impacts down the road than what we have now. Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know if any of that will happen, um, but certainly that's something that history has shown that we're, we're a lagging indicator of, of changes to the economy. Um, I mentioned fee revenues, so I, I'd like to, to discuss that. Um, a lot of people are asking, you know, about our revenues, are our revenues okay? Uh, we are seeing a, a slight decrease in the revenues. We're down about one and a half percent from what we had projected for the year. Um, I have no doubt that some of that is just, you know, less either maintenance fees or filings, you know, less less revenue coming into the PTO. Some of that is also uh, related to some of the relief we gave where people could delay um, some of the work that they were doing. So I have no doubt that both are playing in, but we are trending about a one, one and a half percent um, down. Now we do have a over $3 billion budget, so that's a large number, but percentage wise, it's a, it's a 1.5%. Um, I included on the slide for your reference the you know total applications. I include that because it's just mind-boggling that at any given time uh, there's over a million pending applications uh, that are going on. I thought you would find that interesting. Um, over on the green box, uh, I'll go quickly through this, but I, I just want to give some background. Uh, we all have been watching pendency always. Those of us that are 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 immersed in the patent field and and our total pendency is averaging 23.1 months. Uh, that is going down. But the purpose that I have this slide is, um, the purpose that I have this in the presentation is that I really want you to focus on the second outdented bullet, the patent term adjustment compliance. Um, I am. I would like for all of us to have a much greater focus on compliance with patent term adjustment than average pendencies. Um, average pendencies are great if you're at the average, but they're not really helpful if you have an art unit um, who's who's not at the average, you know, swaying either way. It could be much faster, it could be much slower. What we'd like to focus on, and, and our, you'll see a, a, a transition uh, to a greater focus on this, is our compliance with patent term adjustment. Um, so we have, of course, statutes which tell us how quickly we need to do our work, and if we're not, you know, doing uh, a first action in, say, 14 months or responding to a, an amendment in four months, um, we award patent term adjustment. We would like to be compliant both in the cases we mail and both in the inventory. We feel that's the best measure of, of consistency throughout the office. We feel it's the most uh, clear to our applicants, uh, the best for the patent system. So that is something you'll see us uh, focus on. We have a five-year goal to be 90% compliant with all patent term adjustment timeframes. Uh, and again, that's, that's for uh, not only the cases in the inventory, but also mailed cases as well. We're currently about 84% of mailing uh, and 88% of our inventory is compliant with those timeframes. Uh, again, I highlight that just so you'll, you'll know we're, we're, we're focused on that. 
Going to the orange box, uh, I did want to just point out our, our allowance rate is, is, is about 60%. Um, and then I have the appeal information there. I have this because people are interested in it. I will tell you, uh, we don't have goals of allowance rate. Um, we don't even have goals, honestly, of an appeal affirmance rate or not. Um, we want examiners to make the right decision based on a case in front of them, what they believe is the right thing to do. We don't want people shooting for a goal one way or another, but these are numbers um, that, that nonetheless people are interested in. They are, they are uh, certainly interesting numbers, um, but wanted you to have them as well. Okay, with that, Jean, I can go to the next slide. Okay, now I'm gonna get into a little more of, of the big changes uh, that we have coming on, on October 1st. And in my opening remarks, I talked about uh, fundamental or foundational changes that, that we're making. And uh, if you go right to those dashes on the screen uh, under the second bullet, you can see the changes uh, that we're making. And, and these really, uh, when you step back, they really impact uh, virtually everything an examiner sees on a daily basis. So, so when I when I say they're foundational, um, this will give you an idea of what I meant by that. Um, first of all, we we have been changing uh, examiner time for many examiners. Uh, this actually started last year. We made some changes last October to examination time, uh, and it will be making additional changes this October. Um, last year, what we did is we made time. Uh, we made two changes to time. One, we raised the lower end of the time that examiners get. So that tech, you know, some of these time changes actually haven't changed in 30 to 40 years. Some areas where the times were so low and the technologies have advanced that it just wasn't reasonable to do the uh, amount of work an examiner needed to do in that time. So we raised the, the floor uh, of time that examiners get in their production system. And we also uh, created a new system where examiners would get time based on certain uh, attributes of an application. So if an, if an application had more claims, you know, I think it's greater than 20 claims, or if there was a you know, certain number of IDS references filed or pages of references filed, um, we, we would give an examiner more time uh, than they have for other applications which don't have those attributes. That was our way to make the system more more smart uh, and, and more uh, consistent with the amount of work coming in that an examiner has to do. Uh, we are making additional time changes uh, this October and, and uh, for the most people it's actually it's going to be an increase in time. Um, basically uh, it's, it's way too detailed for me to get into here but I want you to be aware of it but what, as you're going to learn in, in Jay's discussion we're going to have a, a pretty refined uh, CPC picture of every application, and we're using that to, to help us move towards the time that an examiner should get uh, to examine an application. Um, but it, I, my goal today is that you all recognize uh, that we are making time changes. We are trying to uh, update some, some times that have gotten uh, out of whack and haven't really been updated again in many instances in 30 to 40 years uh, where they were set. The second bullet goes to the performance appraisal plan. So I'm assuming most people know what a performance appraisal plan is, but uh, every examiner, actually every employee of USPTO, me included, has, has a performance appraisal plan, which outlines what you are supposed to be doing in your job, how you get evaluated, et cetera. Um, we have made uh, uh, many changes uh, to the examiner's performance appraisal plan, uh, changes that will take place October 1st. And so that is, is a, a large change um, these changes, uh, there, there's, there's again much to get into here, and I know that's not a goal. I, I want you to be aware of what we are doing. Um, but some of the changes, for example, are an enhanced focus on the examination search. Um, so we're, we're, we're really pushing uh, search, making sure you know that that examiners are doing the right search, and we have increased. Uh, the, the guidance and and goals for examiners and their performance plan appraisal plans with regard to search. We're also addressing things like having a clear prosecution record. Um, we're giving them a, a better you know, roadmap of how to write a high quality office action. So these are our, our large changes um, that we feel are going to be very helpful in, in moving us forward to higher quality um, and to having a, a better and more effective and efficient prosecution. 
Some other changes uh, that you'll also hear about are Count Monday will be going away after uh, or sometime in October. I don't know the exact date, but in early October, um, Count Monday will be going away. That is one that seems to be the most interesting to practitioners. Um, because I know I know people pay attention to what, whether it's Count Monday or not, um, but we are effectively going uh, getting rid of Count Monday. I will tell you, I'm coming up to my 26th year at PTO. Um, Count Monday has been a stressor for many people for as long as I can remember, and I'm sure well before I was at PTO. Um, we don't want to put our supervisors in a situation where they have to review a lot of work um, at the end of a pay period trying to get it in um, and quite frankly, Count Monday was always a new day and a new bye week. Why we permitted work to be done that way for the previous bye week doesn't make sense to me. Um, and so we are, will be doing away with that. The, the bye week will end on Saturday. Um, supervisors can review the work after Saturday. And as long as it was handed in and it's correct, it will get counted for the time the examiner handed it in. Seems like a much smarter system to me. It takes the pressure off our supervisors, that's where they can give the proper review um, and examiners know exactly when they have to hand in work, seems like a much more clear system to me. Um, so, so Count Monday will be going away. Uh, and you'll also see uh, changes to examiners' docket sizes. Uh, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're going to uh, smaller docket sizes with much more fre frequent refreshing of their dockets. So examiners will have smaller um, numbers so they'll, this will help uh, them work on first in first out but we will refresh weekly uh, an examiner's docket so that they won't run out of work we actually piloted this um, and we saw some really good results um, of the pilot so that is generally um, what i wanted to say gene i have a number of slides after i actually talked right through them um, on this slide but but you can advance uh, just so I can explain what they are, you can advance to the next slide here. So uh, this is what I, I talked about with the time changes. Again, these, these are for your, for your reference, um, but I, I talked uh, about all of this already. Gene, you can go to seven. Next one is the performance appraisal plan. Um, and then you see the application routing. And we can pause here for a quick second. Um, I am thrilled to have uh, two of my colleagues here, two group directors. Um, one, of, one of my goals moving forward uh, is that I, I get some of the, the, the really smart and great employees that we have at USPTO um, out to, to talk with uh, members of the public. And I know, you, you know people uh, hear from me a lot, you hear from the deputies a lot, and we've got great people behind us uh, and working with us, such as, as Jay and Matt. And so I'm thrilled to have them here. So when Jean reached out to me and, and asked if I would do this, uh, I was very happy to do this and share uh, the great work, but I'm really thrilled to have um, Jay, who's going to walk through uh, the routing that's going to take uh, effect on October 1st. And then Matt will talk about a more aspirational uh, view of, of uh, artificial intelligence, as he said, and I'll just reiterate that that Matt's portion is, is not slated uh, to take uh, impact or, or to start any particular date, that is something that we're still working on, again, more aspirational. Um, so those, those are, that is what I wanted to share, and um, I'm happy to take any, any questions, Gene, if you want to do that, or we can wait to the end, whatever you think is best. Well, we could probably do a, a couple questions right now. There's a couple, at least quick questions here, I, I see, um, about um, when the public search room might reopen and then when the copy room might reopen so file wrappers could be obtained. And I don't know whether you have any information on that or are you in wait and see mode? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're definitely in wait and see mode. Um, uh, like everyone else in the country, uh, we are reopening in phases. Um, we've gone, as I mentioned earlier, from the mandatory telework to the, to the phase one, which is, which is maximum telework, but, but still people some people can come in. Um, I wish I had a better answer in terms of a date, but I, I think for the safety of everybody, we're taking an approach of a wait and see. We're working with local officials. Um, and so I, I don't really have those dates uh, because we just haven't, we don't have them yet. Um, and, as, and, and as we're monitoring the, the impacts of the pandemic and the changes, we will of course have more specific information as it's appropriate. 
And then another potentially quick one might be here is, have you looked at the filing trends of small versus large entities? Um, and one of the, because I, I found it interesting what you were saying about the, the decrease, the 2.5% decrease, which is, you know, is, is meaningful, but it's, 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 it is small. And I have heard from uh, a number of patent attorneys that, you know, what you would expect in this type of situation, the large companies, they hunker down, they, uh, they always seem to research and develop less and patent less uh, at these types of times. Um, and then the, the, but the small companies and the individuals um, are really going to town. And I, I mean, I, I see a lot of activity there. So ha have you looked at, at that and see whether there is that disconnect or difference? Sure. So, so I don't, um, at the tip of my fingers, have that information. Um, so I don't know that, and I and I will certainly take a look into that. I I know for a fact we have people who who are analyzing our, all of our filing trends for large and small for everybody, um, and it's part of our the analysis we do to help us predict what our what our expected. Um, revenues and filings are moving forward, but I don't have those. I'm more than happy, Gene, to follow up with you on that, though. Yeah, that, that would be really interesting because, you know, what, what I'm hearing is, uh, and the 2.5% decrease number did not really surprise me because what I've heard is that, you know, firms have a, uh, clients of all different sizes, many of them do, and the larger entities are hunkering down but that uh, what, what I've heard in a lot of cases is, is that the smaller entities have made up or almost made up the difference. And, um, and that, that if that's really what's going on, that I think that that is really good news for the future in America. And, and that's really what you would normally expect. Uh, maybe not, you know, pandemic is, is you know, hopefully once, a, once in a lifetime and once in many, many lifetimes, hopefully. But with these types of, um, I know we're probably not technically in a recession, but you see in recessions or pauses in economic activity where creative people take that opportunity to create. And, and so there may be a silver lining message here. Uh, so if you, if you could, that'd be wonderful. No, I'd be happy to, and, 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 and you know, you're raising a number of good points. I, I will tell you in the last, say, 20 years, uh, I think every year except for one, there's been increased filings uh, compared to the previous year. So uh, while those numbers are small um, and they've ranged, you know, in anywhere from 1% to 4 or 5%, but we've always increased, I think it was 2000, it's either 8 or 9, I think it was 2009, um, where we didn't have, have an increase based on the previous, or compared to the previous year, and that was after the, the financial impacts of 2008. Yeah. So, um, Megan, uh, do you have anything that you'd like to ask Drew at, th at this point before we uh, turn over to, to James? There is one question I wanted to surface, and I, I know this isn't our topic for today, but I think a lot of people are interested in, in the way that you're changing examiner's dockets. So, so by reducing the size of the examiner's docket, does that mean that an application just sits longer on, you know, on the backlog before it's being assigned to anyone? Can, can we expect longer times then before an examiner is assigned? Right. Uh, no, it's a good question. So, so the answer is no. Um, what you're going to hear from Jay, and this is a great lead into to Jay's conversation. What you're going to hear is that with the smaller dockets, and and I, I don't want to be, um, I want people to understand that we're not just saying smaller dockets and comparing that to today. It's smaller dockets with more frequent refreshing so that examiners will constantly have work. There's no way an examiner will run out of work. By the way, we get asked of examiners too because of filing differences that we're running out of work, but PTO is very far from, from that. We're nowhere near, near that. But to answer your question, Megan, um, cases we will be, with the routing scheme that we're putting into place, not only will we be able to better match the technology to the right examiner, but we'll be able to do better workload balancing so I think this is a game changer for us in terms of making in, uh, improvements to pendency as well as quality by ensuring that the applications get to the right examiner. So, you know, if you, if you, think, it's, if you think about it, we're not increasing or decreasing the amount of work in the door. So if we had large dockets for examiners, cases could potentially sit on the examiner's docket for a long time. What will happen is now with smaller, more frequent refresh, 
nothing's going to sit there because they're going to have to do what's on their docket and we will have the ability to see who needs work where are the best you know where, where are the, the low points so to speak in terms of backlog and we can divert the work there as long as people are qualified to do that work and that's what jay's going to get into um, in, in his discussion so can i follow up on that uh real quick so does that mean because i've been a fan i think as you know i think we've talked about this compact prosecution i've always thought that if examiners and attorneys too and agents were um working on applications in a more condensed over a more condensed period of time that you would you'd get better institutional memory on both sides and a better quicker outcome is is that what you're trying to accomplish with this you, you know so so you and i have talked about this and and i'm actually a, a complete fan like you are of being able to a, address that issue and have a, a more real time back and forth um, throughout prosecution that being said i don't think that the changes um, and, and, and certainly Jay and Matt, if you feel otherwise, chime in, but I don't feel these changes really address that issue. Um, okay. These changes will make sure that we are working the, you know, the, the first, first in, you know, first out in better, you know, in better order. They'll make sure that we're getting the right case to the right examiner. Um, and, and again, a key component of that is also workload balancing. So for example, if we say, okay, these five examiners are all qualified for this application, we'll be able to see which, you know, who, who needs the work the most or who, who can turn that case around the fastest. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Megan, are we uh, ready to move on to Jay? Yeah, let's go. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Commissioner. I really appreciate that, and uh, look forward to having you stick with us. And and uh, if we have some time at the end, we'll sure have some more questions for you. But uh, Jay, I think the floor now is yours. Actually, Gene, we need to show the slide with the participant code. Oh, real okay. Quick. There we go. <laughs> oh, and I probably should have done that, and because it has questions there. <laughs> uh, jump no in when I'm making. Okay. Jump in when I I'm make a mistake, to... Allie. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, everybody so you want to tell the, because we've had uh, almost 300 people join since you made that announcement at the beginning. Do you want to tell people what this is about again? Yeah, absolutely. So everybody that's attending, please just make sure that you take note of this participant code that's listed here on this slide. And then there will be another one later on in the presentation as well. You will need to have both of those numbers in order to be able to redeem your CLE certificate. We are only able to show them one time during the webinar and we are not able to then, if you say, oh, I missed it in the chat feature, we are not able to give you that code then after the fact. So those are CLE requirements, not ours. I apologize for that. But please make sure you write this down. And then as I mentioned, there is another one later on. Okay, so let's just pause here for a quick second and make sure you write this down, okay, everybody. Get this code. It is 899 lowercase g7. 899 lowercase g7. All right. So um, so now we are ready to go on to Jay. Thanks, Gene. Yeah, so uh, I get the unenviable task of following Drew. Never fun, but I'll do the best I can here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some changes that are going to come to the USPTO with regard to how we route applications. Uh, so before we jump right into that, I'm gonna start with some background slides. So if we can advance to the next one. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about classification. Um, I, I always compare classification to like a, just to make it simple, to like a Dewey Decimal System that everybody learned in elementary school in the library. And it's just a way of assigning a number to an incoming document. In, in the case of a library, they assign a number to a book. It's based on its, it's based on its um, topic. So if it's a book, a nonfiction book on trees gets this number, a fiction book by this author gets a different number. And so, and it's just a way that you can find things quickly and easily. You can group documents together. So all nonfiction books by trees can get, get uh, put together in the same place in the library. And it makes it easy to find. At the USPTO, this is what we do with incoming applications. Uh, they come in and we, and based on the underlying technology that's within the application, we assign it a number. We call that a classification symbol. And, and we use this classification for a lot of things. You can see from the slide here, uh, we, we group technologies together. 
We match that technology to an, app, to an examiner and we, uh, we use that technology to assign time. So that's how much time the examiner is allotted to work the case. And then of course it's used primarily for search and retrieval as, as we look to make office actions and, and make patentability determinations. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide. Uh, this is kind of the, the milestone moment, I guess. The watershed moment was in October of 2010. We signed an agreement with the EPO in order to change from what was our U.S. patent classification system to this new cooperative patent classification. Uh, it's a significant step towards harmonization, specifically as, as it stands today. Well, if you, in terms of harmonization, if you think about the future being, being versions of work sharing between, between offices, and PPH is a pretty good example. So if something, you know, a case gets allowed in one agency, and an applicant files a PPH petition in another agency, the, other, the second agency can use some of the work done by that first agency. We can look at file wrappers, we can look at searches. So having a shared classification system, one where we can more readily understand and maybe interpret the search done by another office will help us to achieve better harmonization of our, of our searches and our, and our work. So th this new, going to a cooperative system does help harmonization. I looked this up before this meeting, and as of now, it's close to 50 other IP offices have now also come into CPC. So it's not just the USPTO and, and the EPO. Many of the EPO's member states are also using this. Korea's converted to CPC. Uh, China's converted to CPC. So like I said, many, many worldwide agencies are, are using this. And lastly, it is a more flexible system. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And it, and it is more up to date uh, because we're committed with other agencies. We're, we're routinely keeping it up to date and modernizing it. And that's the same, you know, all of a sudden you get a new technology, you need new, you need to update your scheme to capture that. That's part of what keeping it up to date means. So uh, the next slide, I'm going to go into uh, some of the differences between what, what, what the U.S. patent classification, which we call USPC, and the cooperative patent classification, which is CPC. So this is an important slide. I'll spend a little bit of time walking through this so that you can understand the differences. I think as you understand the differences, you'll understand the challenge we had in coming up with a new routing system. And I hope maybe uh, you'll appreciate some of the elegance of what we've come up with as you understand the differences. So, so first, before, some, before I talk about the symbol, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how, just it's, how it's a little bit of a different classification. It's a, I, I mentioned earlier like the Dewey Decimal System, but it is just a different way to classify the documents. Uh, an example that I kind of give, that just a conceptual example is, imagine one thing where, where everything grouped trees by oak, maple, elm. And so anything that came in that had anything to do with an oak tree gets grouped into the oak category. And anything that came in that was a maple tree got in the, in the, in the maple category and so on, so forth. So imagine a second system that said, well, we're not gonna group by tree type, we're gonna group by parts of the tree. So it took all the branches and puts all the branches together. Well, in the second system, you have oak branches, maple branches, but, but it's designed by branches. And so, yes, they're both right. You have the same, you have the same incoming thing, but you one, in one system, you put, them all, put all the pieces of the in tree by the tree type. And in the other one, you'll put all of the, the pieces of the tree together regardless of the tree type. Still the same, but just a different way to group the documents. And conceptually, that's a little bit of what the change, that's, a little, that's an easy way to think about how, how the differences between two classification systems. We still have the same applications. We're not changing what's coming in. We're not changing the expertise of the examiners. We're just grouping the documents a little bit differently. And so, and so that does present a challenge, as I mentioned earlier, and Drew mentioned, in terms of we want to maintain that intellectual expertise of our examiners, but we have this different grouping of cases. How do we go about maintaining that? And that was one piece that was very, very important to us, as I noted earlier, because it's really important. That's, that's the fundamental and critical step to giving quality patent examinations and ultimately making the right patentability determination. Uh, the, last, the second thing that was, and this is kind of a big one, and you'll see it too when we talk about what we went to, with, with the U.S. patent classification, we really only put one symbol on the document. And CPC relies on multiple symbols. You can, put, you can put as many as you want on that application in order to capture whatever pieces of technology might be there. Uh, the example we like to give, again, a conceptual example is, you know, you can have gears and you can have chemical components, I mean, uh, chemical coatings. And, and so in, in the USPTO, we have a, a gear area and we have a chemical component area. And when an application comes in, that's a chemical component, uh, a chemical coating 
on a gear, we'll, we have to pick either a gear examiner or a coding examiner to work that case. And there's sometimes a lot of intellectual exercise, a lot of delay in trying to work back and forth to understand what's the underlying technology, where does it go in the future? Because we can put now with CPC, both the gear and the chemical component, we can go try to find that right examiner who has the expertise in both the gears and the chemical coding. And we don't have to, it's, it's not this backward, or it's not this offline sort of intellectual exercise. We can let the classification help steer it again to that right examiner, which again, we hope improves examination, brings better quality, memorializes that institutional knowledge. So uh, I'll get into some examples of how, how this works in a minute. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so, one, and we, we've talked about a couple of these things, or we've definitely hit on these. Again, the goal, we number one, we needed to shut off USPC. It doesn't make sense to maintain, from a cost perspective, two classification systems. It's a burden on examiners to have to understand two, one, one that routes to me, one that I'm searching or examining, and so really to, to relieve that administrative or that cost burden. But also really, and we've talked about this several times, it was a fundamental goal to maximize the retention uh, the retention of the expertise and knowledge of our examiners. That was that was the challenge uh, all along. Was how do we how do we keep doing the same quality work we've always done, but route cases differently? So on the next slide, I'll start talking about some of the concepts and the way that we go about um, uh, routing the cases. So if we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so there's two there's two ways to think about this. We've talked about CPC symbols or classification symbols. And we talked about how in CPC, we can put more than one symbol on an application. And so what we call that, that combination of symbols, we call that the classification picture. And so when incoming application comes in, we, we assign it these CPC symbols based on the technology, and that becomes the classification picture on the application. In addition, as every time an examiner works on an application that has a classification picture, we can capture that information that, that of what cases and, and what technologies they've worked on historically, and that becomes what we're calling an examiner's portfolio. And so I'm going to explain now a little bit more and give some examples of an examiner's portfolio just so you can understand how that concept works. So let's go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, it's a representation of an examiner's work experience. And so below you'll see the kinds of work. So anytime an examiner does a final or a non-final, an allowance, a quail, or an examiner's answer, the, the classification picture on those applications fil filters into a portfolio for that examiner, and we capture that every time they submit one of these pieces of work. And so I have sort of a, a little bit of a graphical example or, or a, on the next slide that kind of walks through that. So in this case, you have a single examiner who's done two cases. One is a non-final and one is an allowance. On the non-final, the, the, the classification picture had a CPC symbol A, a CPC symbol B, and a CPC symbol C. On the allowance, the application had a, the, that application's classification picture had CPC A, CPC B. In this case, it also had CPC D. So the examiner has done two, two count-producing actions, in this case, with those, with those symbols on it, and therefore that little box would become that examiner's portfolio. I guess it would be, that would be if the examiner had done no other work. Uh, consider what would happen is that work would then attribute as an addition to all the other work the examiner's done and it becomes like an addition. So the examiner would receive two additional, what we're calling tallies in CPCA, two additional tallies in CPCB, and then one tally in CPCC and CPCD. So again, in, you'll have this big table and this examiner will have, will have a combination of all these tallies and that becomes the examiner's classification or examiner's portfolio. So on the next slide, I'll walk you through how we would take various portfolios and apply them to an application. So as you can see here, uh, in this case, you have one application with four examiners. The one application has these five CPC symbols. So in this case, CPC A, B, C, D, and E. And we have examiner A, B, C, and D across, across the rows or across the columns rather. And so the rows indicate how many tallies or how many work products those examiners have done with that classification picture. So you can see examiner A in this case has 45 tallies in CPCA, 32 tallies in CPCB, 21 in CPCC, 9 in CPCD, and 7 in CPCE. 
And if you compare him to the compare him or her to the other three examiners, that examiner is the best qualified examiner to work that application. And so this is the kind of analysis that we can do, again, comparing these incoming classification pictures to every examiner's work product or, or examiner portfolio, and we can try to identify the best examiner. Uh, and so at the end of the day, what, what, what generally happens in situations like this, you'd see these, um, you know, examiner A and examiner B probably are both very qualified. Examiner C is, is pretty close to qualified. And so, and so when we do this across 8,000 examiners on a single application, we end up with collections of qualified examiners. And so on the next slide, we walk through some other things that we use once we have that pool of qualified examiners to sort of make, we call them sometimes tiebreaker or really, or really fine tuning to get even the better examiner, right? Who has the most experience, the most knowledge. And this is some, these are some other considerations we use. And Drew mentioned earlier, right, the size of that examiner's docket. So uh, again, we're, we're, we're going down to smaller docket sizes with more, with more refreshes. So which examiners have openings in their dockets that need cases? We look at them with. Uh, we also look at when we say we, we can see for a, for a certain application how many examiners are qualified. But you can also do the inverse, which is for an examiner see how many applications they would be qualified to work. And obviously, if you had an examiner who had who has lots of other qualified work, we would want to prioritize examiners who didn't, so that we're not taking away. So again, we look at who's qualified to do how many how many people are qualified to do a certain application, and then how many applications are each individual examiner are qualified to work on. And then lastly, we use some similarity. We do use some similarity techniques, things like uh, cosine similarity, Euclidean distance in order to match examiners to these things, to these, to these applications. Again, once we find the pool of qualified examiners, we use these techniques to sort of fine tune it in on, on just that right examiner, or that best qualified examiner. So that's really, I think that comes to the end of what I was going to talk about. Uh, that's sort of our, our new routing scheme. As Drew mentioned, this is going to start on October, on October 1st. That's the start of our, our fiscal year. Uh, I think we'd be happy to take questions now if, if there are any. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of uh, questions there. Megan, do you have any questions that you want to, you want to start with or? I mean, I, I think, and, and this is this is a little bit of a theme too, and this is something we talked about before the call, but I, I think people could benefit from hearing about it. So, so right now the way it works, right, is that the application gets assigned a primary USBC code, and then it gets routed to an art unit, and then the C um, distributes it to all the to whichever examiner in their art unit they think is the best, right? Um, so, so under this new system, it, it really fundamentally changes the function of the art unit. Right. So, so what's going to happen to art units? Are they still going to exist in their same form, or are things going to get switched up? Jay, do you want me to jump in on that one? Yeah, sure. So, so it, it is a it is a great question because um, uh, previously, li literally, a single symbol would be used to send you know to send an application, and then the SPI would have to try to remember. Is it this person or that person who had the other expertise? And of course, that's not a workable construct. The construct is workable because we did it, but it's not a great construct. The construct we'll have now will be much more granular and it will also be automatic. So you're right, it definitely changes uh, the need for art units as we know them. However, um, in my mind, the, the primary reason for the art units is the training of the examiners and the SPEES do an awful lot of training um, and by the way, the SPEES are the ones who are training on all of these changes I've discussed today, the PAP, the routing, and the time changes. But the SPEES will be training their examiners on, on examination. They'll be there to answer questions. You'll have a balance of newer people in an art unit and more senior people who can also help. So I think the art unit construct, while not necessarily needed after October for classification in the same way as we've needed it, I still think is very valuable for ensuring the right training and, and education of our staff. Yeah, yeah so the SPEES can, and we talked before, so the SPEES yeah. can focus on probably what they should be focusing on. Right, um, and, and, and exactly. You know, the, the whole an idea of this um, is, is that supervisors who who might be spending a lot of time classifying or figuring out where the right cases go now will have that burden, so to speak, lifted from them uh, and, and hopefully be able to spend much more time on, on what their main priority is, and that's training examiners. 
Right. Yeah, the art unit right. becomes a lot more about mentoring the younger uh, examiners from the, the SPEES perspective, it seems. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we have a number uh, of uh, specific questions here about how this mechanically is going to is going to work um, from are you going to well, let, I mean, let's start with this one. Right now, the classification is uh, done to some extent or facilitated by an outside contractor. Is that still going to be the case after this uh, change? Yes. So, so we still we we actually have been having our contractors now um, starting to to be prepared for this change and start to put symbols on in the broader way of the CPC as opposed to the single singular um, symbol for the USPC. So we have been working with our contractors to do that. Um, you're going to hear from Matt about some potential of down the road of of using AI in this space. Um, but for the for the near future and, and certainly um, foreseeable future, what we will be doing is continuing with uh, with the classifiers that we have. And, and as you said, they're mostly contractors. Um, they will be uh, putting the symbols on. And then when we have it, it's it'll be our job to say, you know, all this is done uh, automatically. Um, you know, we've got the symbols from the classifier. Now, how do we match that to the portfolio of the examiner and get those best matches that Jay was talking about? So, and is that best matching going to be done in, in your, your office, Drew? Um, I'm not sure how to answer. I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a IT system that will do that. I don't know, Jay, if you have more there, it's, it's not, again, it won't be a person. It'll be done automatically. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Not going to move just, those servers into your office, Drew. Don't worry. No, no. What I, what I meant was, I, I guess what I meant was, so so just it's going to be done outside of the the art unit group uh, or TC. It, so it's not something that like the TC can influence, so to speak. Correct. It's yeah. Done no, I mean one of the but one of the benefits is is we'll be able to like as 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 we're talking about, we'll be able to cue things and make determinations at, a, at an agency level rather than a TC, which we do hope will, will help improve penancy because, like we said earlier, things won't, things won't sit and stockpile in one art unit. We'll have them, we'll have them at a master, master queue across the core, across the whole, all, of, all of patents and make those decisions. Okay, where should this case best go? Where's the best fit for it? So. Yeah. And then I have one more question before, Megan. I'll turn back, kick it back to you. Um, there's a question about how it would be, um, the classification will be done. Is it gonna be focusing on the, the claims or is it gonna be the entire disclosure or um, do you have any more information on that or is that still you finalizing how that's gonna be done or what can you maybe tell us about, about that? Okay. Yeah, so, so um, the original CPC classification that there will be There'll be both types of actual classification on an incoming application. So the application under CPC will get a full classification picture of everything in it from the claims to the to the spec to the background, anywhere a technology is described, it will receive a CPC symbol. Then we'll take a subset of those symbols and identify them as 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 related to the claim. And again, that's that's a fine-tuning way of really trying to find the best examiner when you can you can identify things that the examiners both worked on and worked on in a claim set, that would be another another way to sort of fine tune that matching when, we, when we're trying to find that right examiner. So it'll actually receive both. So yes and, and yes. Okay. Yeah, if Good. I can add, that, that, sure. that's, some of the, that's some of the main benefit to, to what yeah. we're doing is we'll have a much wider classification picture, not only to the claims, um, but to the whole entire application, as Jay said, but tying back to our performance appraisal plan, and I had mentioned earlier that uh, part of that plan was to have a, 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 a heightened focus on the search. Um, part of what we are pushing in the search is searching the entire application, not just the claims, uh, so that we're getting a more comprehensive search done for the applicant. And, and oftentimes we hear things like, well, I made a change and, and, and now the examiner says it's a whole new search. The whole idea would be we have broader searches. Oh, yeah, we've heard that one before. <laughs> These tie together very well. Yeah, and you know, I I mean, I laugh, but you know, I I get it. You know, sometimes 
uh, you, you file claims and you realize, okay, those are a dead end. Let's see what else I have in the specification. And, you know, examiners have a finite limit, you know, a window and, you know, some, you know, the truth is always gray is what it winds up being. But um, um, Megan, do uh, you have any more questions for Jay before we move into um, Matt's segment? Yeah, yeah. So th this question came up, and and we get this question all the time um, about how the old routing system operated, um, and and it's about continuation applications. So when you file a continuation, is there some presumption that it's going to go to the same R unit, and now a presumption that it's going to go to the same examiner, or do you treat every new application with a clean slate? So well, that's a great question. So, so right under USPC, it does get routed to that same, it gets routed to that same art unit, and then the supervisor manually has to go in and make that determination. Oh yeah, I can see this person did, this person did, apparently I'll give it to that person. And again, in the future, that'll all be automated. It'll automatically get routed to the examiner who did, who did the parent. We'll, we'll track all that. We have that data and we'll, and we'll make sure that happens. So, so every continuation automatically goes to the same examiner by default? That's what will happen in the future, yeah. Okay. What about a continuation in part or a divisional? So, so divisionals can, can go to different examiners. And as, as we said, that's, that's actually tying back to the question Gene just asked. That's an important part of understanding a distinction between claims and just specification. So assuming the divisional came in in a way that the classification picture, in particularly the claimed classification picture changes, those could get routed to a different examiner I'd put I'd put CI uh, I'd put the continuations in part in the same in the same boat. It depends on the breadth of the change and what it does to the classification picture. Okay, okay, and then, and then my the other. Oh, go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, jumping in there, but I'll just add that examiners and supervisors can always look to transfer a case, right? To to move a case if it's not their subject matter. So so just like it is today, where people can can move cases, it'll be a different process. Uh, moving forward, but but the idea is that if it's not the right case for somebody, that person will not be examining it. So for any reason, our system is not as accurate as we hope and think it will be. We'll we'll, we'll be able to make those manual adjustments. Okay, I have two yeah, questions on, on that because the question I always wind up getting about that is is well, do the applicants have the ability to ask for a change of examiner because they think they've gotten the wrong uh, art unit, which I suppose now getting in the wrong art unit is going to be completely irrelevant it'll be just being signed the wrong examiner right yeah so 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 people do have the ability to ask there's a petition process for that it is you tip i, I don't i'm not aware of any time we've actually changed because somebody thinks it's the wrong examiner technology wise right the, usually when people are asking it's because They'll say there's been a problem in prosecution or something like that. So it is a rarity that we that we do change the examiners to be blunt, um, but it, but it certainly right. has. But but and and that's what know. I always say. And, and just so and make sure I'm giving folks the right information, Drew. Is you you have an extraordinarily high burden to change the examiner, right? It's almost got to be the cases I'm familiar with. There was really almost malfeasance on the part of the examiner, right? Like there was documented uh bias or maybe almost racial or sexist comments or something ex extraordinary like that right well i'm i'm not aware of any of those situations occurring so so hopefully that's 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 not the case ever um i it is a petitions process and and i can't articulate the exact standards here i do agree with you it's a high bar um but i i i think i, yeah. I can't would i, okay, I then, wouldn't want to We'll be trying to dive into specifics. Well, and that's fine because the Office of Petitions, do they fall under your, you, or they're sort of independent on their own, right? Uh, no, they're, they're the, the Office of so Petitions at PTO are handled in two different ways. There's a separate office which would handle these type of petitions, and then some of the petitions are handled in the CC and that they're all in my purview. Okay. Yeah. All right limit myself to one more question, <laughs> but I, I think somebody asked this, and, and I do think it, it's interesting. Um, is there, is, what is one of the considerations whether or not an examiner has handled a lot of applications for a particular company? Because I could, I could especially see for a small company that operates in a really niche space that all their applications could end up going to the exact same examiner. 
and and so is there is there any way that that you guys would account for that? Yeah, because that could oh, either be really yeah. good or really bad. And that's interesting. <laughs> that, right now, I'll be honest with you. Right now, all, all of our matching is pretty independent of who the inventor. I mean, who the inventor, who the assignee. We we don't even really. I, I don't think we look at that very much at all. Um, something we could certainly think about and consider how it would impact. But it's not something we're doing yet. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. What the, I, I'm not sure which way that goes. I was just curious because I, I could I could see that happening um, where a single examiner basically has all the applications for an entire company. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, that could be good. And it also, you know, I mean, let, let's face it, there are some patent attorneys and agents out there that we, we are engineers at heart and scientists at heart. Communicating is not necessarily our, our strongest foot, so to speak. Uh, and the way I said that is probably obvious, makes it obvious. Um, and, uh, you know, you can really develop some kind of um, friction between examiners. So that can be a real issue uh, if that were to happen. Yeah, I can also see people uh, now asking, requesting that they work with Joe or something when they, when they file their application. Um, yeah, we've already got that question here is, can you ask for yeah. a certain examiner, <laughs> like reserve a table? <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, um, I think that's all we, we have. Do you guys have anything else you want to say before we move on to Matt? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, great. And next is uh, Matt, you're up. So thanks, Gene. Uh, I'm going to turn away now from what we're actively doing uh, for CPC to uh, that Jay discussed and start talking about some of the next generation tools that we are targeting and uh, where we have development programs underway. So uh, artificial intelligence um, research and implementation can advance national priorities uh, for intellectual property by ensuring that it contributes to strong, predictable, and consistent IP rights. And agency leadership has championed leveraging artificial intelligence to leapfrog our current capabilities for business processes and a few other use cases. Um, the USPTO has been very busy as of late laying foundations for rapid implementation of useful and reliable AI systems. And as we move towards implementation of artificial intelligence, we do envisage that there may be corresponding shifts in the way that we do business because we seek to couple the strengths of this technology together with the strengths of our employee for the benefit of the IP system. So you can flip to the next slide. So this is actually reflected in our strategic plan, which supports leveraging artificial intelligence to advance our mission of fostering innovation. Um, I'm gonna share some of the efforts that we're undertaking today to leverage AI to make improvements to our processes. I'm gonna explain some of the strategies that we're employing to navigate the challenges of employing this particular technology. Um, I would note that uh, my comments today are focused on patent classification. Um, but uh, we are also actively exploring important use cases in the trademarks area, and I wouldn't want to overlook them as well. But before I get into the topic, I wanted to first make a comment about uh, artificial intelligence and the definition. We often get asked, you know, what is artificial intelligence? And I think the answer to that question largely depends on who you ask and the particular use case that you're attempting to apply the technology to. Um, broadly speaking, it references computer systems that are able to perform tasks that would normally require human in intelligence or human intervention. And so if you think about it from like the science, science fiction perspective, you may envisage uh, you know, robots that are very human-like. But from our perspective at the USPTO, we take a very expansive view of the technology as a tool that we can leverage to improve agency operations and, and, and streamline processes. So this includes our development capabilities around things like machine learning, which can be both supervised and unsupervised, natural language processing, using deep learning or neural networks, 
and those types of technologies. So these are uh, well-established technologies. And again, we take an expansive view about what artificial intelligence is. Um, we also very much take the view that uh, implementation of AI is an augmentation tool to insist with increasing our quality and efficiency for our examiners and the agency. And I'll talk about the patent uh, uh, classification use case um, in the next couple of slides, so you can move forward. So one interesting um, AI technique that's quite mature in this field is what's called machine learning. And with this technique, a data scientist can expose the computer system to a large number of examples from different known categories um, as what we call training data to build a machine learning model. And these examples can be anything that has a lot of information associated with it. So it could be things like photographs, if you're interested in some sort of image recognition technology or capability. It could be uh, financial information if you're in the banking sector, or it could be patient records if you worked in healthcare. And the computer takes all that information that's associated with each of the examples that it was provided, and it looks at that and tries to find patterns in the data that are associated with each of the particular categories. And so this creates a trained machine learning model. And then using that model, you can give the computer a new example and ask it to predict an appropriate category based on the patterns that it's discovered. So clearly the advantage of this approach is that the logic for every single decision within very complex systems doesn't require explicit instruction to be built directly into the computer. And the machine can sift through impossibly large data sets and discover patterns that would be very difficult for programmers to reasonably accomplish by hand. Uh, additionally, computers are very good at detecting very subtle patterns that are deeply embedded in complex data sets. And as Jay had explained uh, earlier, the USPTO uses CPC to classify uh, the content of disclosed, that's disclosed in patent applications. And as Drew noted, we're expecting you know, more than 450,000 filings this fiscal year. And so handling such a large quantity of patent applications requires significant resources and people to do the intellectual work of actually applying those classifications. And all of this makes for a very compelling use case for us here at the USPTO, especially when you consider that there's tens of millions of patent documents that have already been classified in CPC over many, many decades. And this provides us an enormous amount of training data that's useful for developing and validating an AI-based automatic classification system that can both suggest CPC symbols for patent documents, but also, as Jay had alluded to earlier, um, potentially identify uh, uh, those symbols that are most closely associated with the claim subject matter. And we view the, the maturation and operationalization of an auto classification system to offer a variety of potential benefits to the agency. So the first is that the subject matter be thoroughly classified. Um, unlike a human, an auto classification system can consider all the text of the disclosure against all possible classification combinations. And that auto classification system can provide a variety of pre uh, predictions for the CPC symbols that might be best appropriate for that given content. Uh, the second is um, consistency in the way that those symbols are assigned. If you had an automatic system, it would act as a single point or a single classifier for all documents which could potentially reduce the differences in opinion that you might get from different human classifiers about the same content of an application. And we hope that these features could also support quality assurance processes that we undertake here in the agency, since the AI can potentially help the agency more quickly and more thoroughly evaluate the CPC symbols that are already on patent documents. And finally, we foresee the potential to realize operational efficiencies that may in the future help us to reduce some of the resources that the agency has to commit to the classification activities to, in, to ensure that we're maintaining good, good quality. So if you can move the slide forward. So there's a couple of challenges that we face with um, utilizing artificial intelligence for this particular use case with CBC. And I wanted to get a little bit more, uh, have a little bit more information here to kind of contextualize that for you. And the first is complexity. The CPC scheme contains over 260,000 symbols in it, and they all have distinct subject matter. Sometimes, however, that subject matter and those distinctions between the symbols can be quite subtle, even for our most experienced practitioners. And so there's rules and guidance that set forth 
um, what the scope of each symbol is to help users around the world interpret the scheme consistently and apply symbols on patent documents consistently. There's also a, it's a deeply hierarchical structure that has up to 12 levels of indents in certain portions of the scheme, particularly in well-developed technologies. And these challenges can be very tricky for an artificial intelligence system if we do not appropriately account for both the scheme guidance and the hierarchy. An auto classification system without that information that was purely just trained on the patent documents themselves might, for instance, suggest both a parent and child symbol due to the similarity of the content. And so those would be two different symbols that have very, very closely related subject matter. And this could, could cause a conflict with classification rules. And so in response to this, our design is, is looking at ways to consider the scheme guidance through the model training and as well, if necessary, also augment the system with explicit logic to account for these issues. The other thing that Jay noted was that CPC allows for multiple symbols to be allocated to any particular patent application. And so an auto classification system can't simply suggest the most pertinent single symbol. Instead, it has to be capable and sophisticated enough to be able to recognize when the patent document needs multiple symbols. And we're working on ways to account for this as well. So you can go ahead and flip forward. We have built a prototype system uh, here in the agency uh, using artificial intelligence and some of the techniques that I discussed earlier to suggest CPC symbols for US patent documents by looking at the text as well as um, uh, indicators for uh, claimed subject matter. And while we're not yet using the system for our actual patent applications, we do hope to mature the system to the point where we're able to use it in the future. As I noted earlier, the advantage of using a system like this is that the logic for every single decision uh, does not require explicit instruction to be built directly into the system by programmers. And so the, our system can actually predict CPC symbols without human input. Due to the complexity of the scheme uh, and the auto classification system, um, despite that complexity, uh, we have been able to demonstrate that it does operate fast enough in order to keep up with the amount of patent documents that the USPTO publishes each, each week. And so that's a big success for us because um, the, the, the systems themselves are very, very uh, complex. Um, additionally, we're very aware that artificial intelligence systems can sometimes be perceived as a black box where the end users have difficulty understanding the results. And anticipating that this might be a drawback with such systems, we're also prototyping features that provides transparency into the way that the system operates to enable users like examiners to be able to interact with it and understand those results. And we refer to this as explainable artificial intelligence or explainable AI. And the decision-making of the underlying AI models is actually exposed and contextualized for users. So one example of this that we're testing now is to show the examiners the actual portions of patent documents that are most closely linked with each of the symbols that the machine predicts. And this would also include the claims. And finally, we understand the need for the system to evolve as technology changes and also to improve its accuracy over time. And so we've designed in ways to capture feedback from our examiners and classification experts um, in order to be able to refine the system. Uh, we have plans to capture this feedback passively by tapping into the internal CPC quality assurance processes that are already in place and that will be in place in the future. And by doing so, we hope to be able to avoid incurring significant additional costs to make those adjustments and improvements to the system. You can move to the next slide. And in this slide, I'm going to discuss um, some of our current activities. Thank you. So as both Drew and Jay made very clear, um, the quality of classification for patents is extremely important for our operations. And therefore, we are proceeding with a very diligent and data-driven approach to assess and mature the system. Uh, we will only be operationalizing the system to apply CPC symbols on actual patent applications when we reach and sustain uh, quality thresholds that are necessary for us to maintain uh, good operations and, and, and maintain our quality. And our evaluations of the system are currently ongoing. Um, based on the uh, early analyses to date, um, as you might expect, we found some examples 
where the tool produces um, suggestions that are very, very close to the classifications that are already assigned to the patent document. And in many of those cases, they actually overlap with the, the content that's on those patent documents. And we've also found some other examples where the tool appears to suggest output that's divergent from the classifications that are already assigned to documents. So in order to understand the reasons why, we have classification experts that are performing uh, intellectual validations on output from the system. And in some instances for these divergent examples, they've come back and reported to us that the symbols assigned by the auto classification system are actually better or more complete than what's currently available. And then in other instances, they report the opposite where the currently available classifications are actually better. But they also report that they can see why the machine is making certain determinations in those suggestions. And so in response to this, we provide this data to our data science team and our developers to, as feedback, to iteratively update our AI models. And we're also very sensitive to make sure that we're testing for, detecting, and correcting any sort of unintended biases that might result in the system from the training itself in order to ensure that we, don't e we aren't either overusing or underutilizing portions of the scheme when necessary. So as we continue to move forward with this system and development activity and we achieve various performance uh, indicators will continue our integration processes of the auto classification system with our other IT systems that are needed to support CPC in our operations and take further steps towards operationalizing the system within the agency. So I thank you very much for your time and I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, th this has just been fantastic and we have so many questions and I have so many questions. So what maybe we'll have to do is follow up and try and maybe uh, do, a, you know, a, a, an article or something to answer some of these, you know, like questions as many of and take some of the ones that we've already asked and put them into like a uh, an article for, for people because people are really fascinated by this and have very good and directed questions. Um, you know, and I have uh, some like a overarching questions that just keep popping in my mind. I mean, um, one of the ones, and, and I don't know, maybe this is going to be wind up for for Drew, um, is over the, over the years, one of the things that has really concerned me about examination has been uh, what I have perceived at times to be, um, you know, different treatment from different examiners, and that may not be completely fair uh, in 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 a in a vacuum to say it that way, but. There are certain examiners that have a, I think we could probably all agree, have a higher allowance rate than other examiners. And I wonder whether that's going to get considered or as this gets rolled out, how the, you're, are you going to be in a better position to take a look at that? And uh, how, I mean, I know speeds have in, influenced that a lot over the years. I mean, ha have you thought about how that's going to play out when you're kind of grouping examiners by technology compared to the application versus just within an art unit? I'm, I'm not hearing at all. I missed about 90% of that question. Uh, my apologies. I, I was also not being able to hear the end of Matt's presentation, and I don't know if that's just on my end or others i i think your question was about consistency of examination from what yeah. i can tell um and and different treatment and you're nodding your head i can see so um uh to me you know of primary importance is the the training of our examiners and and when people ask me what's the most important uh function that that we have at uspto it's making sure our examiners are are trained um, so whether that's through, you know, trying to have good guidance like the, the subject matter eligibility guidance uh, that we've put out in the last couple of years or we're you know, revamping our training process, this is all foundational to how we move forward. Um, I will say that that I hear from people that, hey, this art unit is, has a higher allowance rate than that art unit. And my answer to that is sometimes, well, maybe that's because of the technology is different and it should have a higher allowance rate because I think we can all recognize that that some areas are more challenging to get allowances and it's not because of the examiner but that being said i'm not i'm not trying to um, push this all to different 
practices and technologies, I, I think it's very important that examiners have a consistent practice. Um, some will reach out, for example, more with uh, interview practice than others and more trying to reach agreement, but we are, that is a, a fundamental piece to how we move forward to make sure that examiners are consistent. And I'll just, I'll apologize if I didn't answer your question exactly, but again, I, no, no, I the yeah, sound was really breaking up. Yeah, no, that, that's good. I mean, I, I was just wondering, um, and, and we could talk more about that. Um, Jay, I think that this one may be one for for you. Uh, in in case most, uh, if the case is, yep. Sorry, can you go to the next slide just so that for people who have to jump off right at the end, we can show them the last participant code sure, for the CLD. Sure. And then we okay. can continue on with. I know there are hundreds of questions coming in here, so yeah. I mean, just make sure so, this code so that you have it when it comes time to give the codes for the CLE credit. So the code is nine lowercase s lowercase e one nine. And we'll leave this up here for a few seconds and then Jean, you can go to the last slide after this has been up for a minute, uh, maybe while Jay answers your next question and then move on. But please make sure that you write this code down to get your CLE. Sure. So Jay, um, in the, if cases are going to go to the most experienced examiner, how do new examiners get cases? I mean, how are you going to assign for, uh, to junior examiners? That's a great question, right? So, so um, I think as you explained, the the predominant way that we train now is that a supervisor or a primary examiner does does the training of the examiner. That's that's the most hands-on. We we give a lot of lectures and we have a lot of training classes, but really the day-to-day -day review of work is done in an art unit by a supervisor or a primary. Uh, our plan would be for a brand new examiner to model a, a, a primary or another or two primaries uh, portfolios, give those to this examiner so that those cases get routed to them. And then as a result, the person who's training them will be very familiar with the work that this examiner got as well. And most of the time when we do our modeling, you know, we'll do our modeling to determine that what area or what kind of portfolios need work, we put examiners where there is an excess of work. So there, that way that way we make sure we're not taking work away from someone else, but we're, we're giving it to someone who can train them, provide assistance, look at the work, review the work, all of that stuff. So yeah, we're gonna model for new examiners that of, of other primary examiners who they're working with. Okay, and then what are you gonna do if an examiner would leave mid-prosecution? How are those cases gonna be reassigned? Yeah, so so uh, and to, and right right now, and uh, our plan is the supervisor. Like like it's going to be the same process that we have today. So a supervisor of that examiner would pull up those cases that have already started prosecution, and and would find examiners that could take that work. Um, we will give them tools, so we can give the supervisor tools to say, hey, based on this work, here are some examiners that have that have high similarity to this work. But that's going to be that that will likely be an intellectual exercise performed by the supervisor and a collection of supervisors to identify the right the right matches for that work. Okay, Megan, do you have any? And that's, uh, done, that's the same thing that's done today, Jim. That's the way we do it today. Okay, Megan, do you have any questions? I could talk about this forever, but I'll, I'll ask one that I think might summarize what, what a lot of people are wondering about for from Matthew's presentation. So there there were a lot of specific questions about the AI and how it was going to work. Um, to the, if and when this ever is implemented, will the AI algorithms be publicly available to people? Um, that is uh, a question that's still under consideration. We're quite a ways away from um, uh, operationalizing some of these uh, algorithms. And so as we continue to move forward with the development of that, we're actively exploring those questions about um, how we're going to uh, uh, how we're going to utilize these both for the agency and potentially uh, what the intersection points would be for the public as well. Okay. All right. And and then one final question. And I, I know this is a tough question since this stuff. I think Drew, you said you, you mentioned that that a lot of these AI implementations are aspirational at this point. But do we have any idea of of when we might be able to? or when you might be able to implement the, the AI algorithm for classification for the application of CPC codes? I, I don't at this point. Um, as, as Matt said in his presentation, we have a prototype and there's still much work to be done on that. We've, we've seen some early successes, I think, enough to be encouraging, but uh, we, we, don't, we have not progressed to the point of having a date yet. 
So I here here's a a uh, quick one. I'm, I'm looking through here and seeing we're getting a lot of uh, strategy questions and drafting questions. And Megan, I think we're going to need to follow up with a webinar on that. And I know the, the patent office doesn't uh, offer advice on strategy or drafting or offer legal advice. So I, I won't ask you guys those questions. But uh, will the CPC have any impact on restricting claims into different groups? So, so the, the the high level answer to that is is no. Anything that we are working on now with a new routing scheme does not change uh, any practices with regard to restriction. Um, we're always looking at that, and quite frankly, I know that's a hot topic issue for many people. But what we have talked about as as no should have no bearing on what an examiner does with regard to restriction. Okay. So uh, another question here. I mean, just quickly, do, do you do you think this is gonna? And this is more of a budgetary question. Is, is this gonna provide uh, uh, some cost savings either now or once you get into the AI implementation? Well, I think absolutely. The the idea is if you can um, have a more efficient automated process that takes people away from having to do a task, it would certainly lead to um, savings. Now, as I as I mentioned, we don't have a date, and this is all aspirational. And my my goal today was that you hear, you know, from Jay on what we are doing and some great steps that are moving ahead, and from Matt about things that are potential for the future. So, if we reach that potential, by all means, I, I do believe there would be a cost savings. Um, here, here's another one. I think you guys could probably answer. Um, do you think that examiners, uh, by going down this path, are going to wind up with a wider field of expertise, a more narrow field of expertise, or is it going to be largely unchanged? You want me to take okay. a stab at that? Or? So, so sure. what's interesting about this that that we think and 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 doing some modeling is it it becomes a little bit. I mean, I like to I like to analogize it to a little bit of a supply and demand. Um, so, so in an area where you have lots of lots of, we talked about finding how many qualified examiners there are for an application, and then how many qualified applications there are for an examiner. In situations where where you have a, a perfect match, there will be little change. In situations where you have more qualified work than you have examiners, then those examiners will tend to narrowly to get, to get a little more narrow as we bring in other examiners to help do that. These examiners will narrow. In other situations where you have more examiners for for work, and and that's that, that happens all the time, right? Technologies, technologies fade and new ones emerge, and we're always looking for ways to make those kind of shifts. And I always laugh. The people, when, when you know, uh, one of our colleagues tells a story that when he first got to the agency, he was in a group of 100 people who did 35 millimeter cameras, and there was two guys down the street that did like cell phones. And you can imagine now it's completely different. So as technologies are always emerging, we're always looking for ways to say how do we how do we adapt and how do we shift. So in situations where that happens. Then those examiners will you know, will be able to use their portfolio to find other work they're qualified for, but they would but they would naturally have to broaden because their technology is 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 shrinking or fading or whatever you want to call it. So I, I don't think there's one answer that says this will happen to everyone. It'll really depend on on the, the makeup and the complexion of that area. And we yeah, think that's and, part and of the, the we too. think that's an exciting kind of dynamic piece of the system that we're we're pretty that we're pretty anxious about. Yeah. Yeah, and I always like to tell you whenever I can. A shout out to uh, to Kyle, my friend Kyle, who was the examiner who um, he's long since retired, but he uh, issued the first MRI patent. And uh, you know, nobody at the office at the time had any experience in anything at all like MRI machines. You know, so the technologies change over time, and it requires examiners to become well versed in things that heretofore had never existed. And and that's what we want, really. You know, you, incremental innovation is great, but paradigm shifting innovation is fantastic. You know, that's what hopefully we're looking to achieve. Uh, Megan, I'll ask one more question, and if you have anything that you want to uh, wrap up with, that would be great. But this kind of goes off the books from what we're talking about, and and I know the the answer here, Drew, but I hear um, from independent inventors frequently as uh because of the the pandemic and they filed provisional applications and now they they're creeping up on their 12 months 
and they've had no time really to uh, test the market or try and get licensing deals or do anything because of lockdowns all over the country. And they're hopeful that the patent office will extend the 12 month time limit in which they can file a non-provisional application. And um, the answer is not not good for them, right? Well, there, the, actually, we, we were able, we do have a notice on this exact issue, I believe. Um, I wanna make sure that I get this accurate, but um, this is something we, we've heard from many folks. So um, I, I would feel more comfortable to go back to that notice and make sure I answer and follow up with Eugene, but this is actually something we did here, and I do believe we were able to address um, and it's oh, really? right on okay, our website. Good. Oh, good. Well, so I'll look at look at that then, because uh, I had uh, I had been telling folks that I didn't think there was anything you could do because it was statutory. But so maybe the CARES Act did do well, I something. Think, I think the CARES Act gave us the ability to to waive deadlines, and so this is an issue we 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 again we did address, and and I'll apologize that I'm not. Uh, having some of the particulars I did in my head at this point, but I, I'd be happy to to follow. Oh, up. excellent. Okay, so then the 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 takeaway is take a look at the USPTO website. Go search the USPTO website um, uh, for for that, and we will also follow up with that uh, on IP Washag as well. Megan, do you have any uh, any final question before we give everybody a chance to give their their final thoughts today? I have so many, but I'll, in the interest of time, I'll let us. I'll, I'll let us move on to the final thoughts. Okay, yeah. Well, th th this really provoked a ton of questions, guys. And I, I don't know whether you have, would have interest in after this rolls out. Maybe we can reprise this, and you know, we can come and talk about how it's going and so forth. But um, I really appreciate a fantastic presentation. Uh, but let's go in the same order as we as we started in, uh, and we'll start with you, Commissioner. Uh, what is the one takeaway that you would like everybody to leave the webinar here today with? Uh, well, I'll go right to where I started in the opening, is that um, we will continue to reevaluate ourselves and see how we can continue to do a better job for all of our 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 filers and all of the public. And I think you learned uh, today of some you know, fundamental changes we're making that I think will make the system better. Uh, and we're gonna continue to look at ourselves. Great, thanks. Jay, what, your parting thoughts. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, you know, you know from, from my perspective, you know, I think it's, it's exciting to get to share the changes. We've been working on these for a long time. So it was really fun and exciting to get to share them with you guys. Uh, and again, uh, from our perspective, we really hope that, you can, that as a result of this change, you see even increased quality or even better quality and, and that you take away that we, that's something that we were really committed to throughout this entire process was just a real commitment to maintaining the institutional knowledge of the examiners, the technical expertise that they bring in examining patents, and we hope that this just makes it better and, and helps provide even a better experience for, for, for you all. I hope this is a positive for everyone. Great, great. I'm I'm optimistic. I think that this is going to be a, a good change, and and I can't wait till we get some data to really take a look and verify that. Um, Matt, your your parting thoughts. What is the future? So I, Look so into your crystal ball. Yeah, I go to, <laughs> I go straight to our mission of fostering innovation, and I think that um, you know we take that to heart here at the USPTO and we seek to innovate as you heard from Jay as well as some of the things that we're looking for in the future as well and um, you know as we go through that process uh, we're always looking to make sure that um, the way that our innovations are implemented here at the agency is is uh, for the betterment of the IP system at large yeah great well thank you and and Megan I'll give you the final word here today <laughs> I, I, I suspect your brain is kind of blown like m mine is. I mean, we, we have a lot of talking to do about all this, to digest it. There's, there's a huge impact for practitioners. Like I said, this, the, the classification process, it, 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 it impacts who the, who the examiner is on the application. And that obviously has a huge impact on what happens to that application. So there, there's definitely a lot we can talk about on, in terms of practical applications. but. But overall, I, I think this is a fantastic move. I think it's going to result in higher quality applications because they're going to get in front of the right person. 
Yeah, I, I, I think that that's exactly what we're going to see as well. And while it wasn't appropriate to get too deeply into it for this webinar, uh, as you probably all know, LexisNexis has been a, a great supporter of mine and lets me uh, pick the webinar topics that I like to do. And we do an awful lot of strategy and drafting and uh, we've got a lot of things to follow up on now about uh, best practices moving forward. And we will continue to do that as a part of this webinar series. So thank you for joining us here today. Thank you, Commissioner. It's always good to see you, even if it's just virtual. Look forward to seeing you all in person once the pandemic makes it safe. You all in the audience, thank you for joining us. Please stay safe and healthy and have a good rest of the week and a good weekend. And we'll see you soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you for having us.